Were there people in the sort of rise, during the rise of Whole Foods that said, John, can you pull that back a little bit? I mean, our clientele, they're hippy-dippy, progressives. Sure, my PR team the whole way along. Yeah. Way, the whole way along. If you would just be a progressive, you would be the toast of the media. They love Whole Foods, but they don't like you. I'm not anti-union. In a, in a free society, unions have to be allowed. And so I always viewed the unions as competitors. They were competing for the hearts and minds of our team members. What is it like living with fuck you money? Um, th 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 I'm Michael Moynihan, and this is Honestly. Today, a conversation with one of the most successful and consequential American entrepreneurs of our time, John Mackey is the co-founder of Whole Foods Market and served as its CEO for 44 years. He grew the brand from a little health food store in Austin to a company that sold for $14 billion. And he's the author of The Whole Story, Adventures in Love, Life, and Capitalism. We discuss, among other things, how Whole Foods changed the way America eats, how having enormous wealth has impacted his life, and what people get wrong about unions. John Mackey, welcome to Honestly. Thanks, Michael. It's wonderful to be here. Now, the, the thing that I saw this morning, I was on the subway this morning, I found this, um, I said, is, are people reviewing the book yet? And I saw some article in I think, Fortune magazine. Headline said, John Mackey, the man who changed the way Americans eat. And I said, well, I never thought of it that way. Do you see yourself that way as somebody who changed the way Americans eat? Or was Whole Foods kind of following trends in America? Obviously, the answer is both. Yeah. The metaphor I come up with, I think it's a pretty good one, is a surfer. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you, have to, you have to catch the right wave if you're going to get a long ride. In a lot of businesses, there's no waves for them to surf, so they can't ride it. We did catch a wave, but we also really helped create that wave. I remember initially we were just kind of a hippie food store. Mm -hmm. And then I always say Walmart actually had a huge impact. When they went from just being... Um, uh, uh, non-food store, and they started selling food, and they mm -hmm. created the super centers. That scared the conventional supermarkets tremendously, with good reason. So they all tried to shift to to look to spend less capital on their stores, to cut their labor back, to cut their service back, even cut the quality of their food back to get less expensive, so they mm -hmm. can compete on price with Walmart. And that really opened up something for Whole Foods, just to have a nice store, mm -hmm. a beautiful store where the food was fresh and beautiful and good and good service and a nice environment to shop in and and we started noticing that we had we still had a lot of hippies in our stores but we had long-haired hippies but we began to get uh, more conventional we'll call them middle upper middle class women shopping in our stores and they didn't know know what the products were per, per se they just knew that the produce was fresh mm. and the meat tasted good and the people, even though they had piercings and tattoos, they were really nice to them. And, and there was somebody they could ask questions to. Mm -hmm. So they became along. And I, I think that, so Walmart kind of made that possible indirectly by just scaring the supermarkets so much that they cut back on the quality of their stores and just to be, become price, 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 enabling us to grow, grow, grow into a, a gap that was there. So a long way around to your question is, I do think Whole Foods, not me personally, but I think Whole Foods Market did have an impact on the way people eat in America. Obviously, though, we, in some ways, our mission failed because we're still America's fat fatter country, than yeah. we ever were. And, yeah. and junk food has hardly disappeared. It's gotten bigger than so when we got started. So is this a class divide thing? Because, I mean, I, I had a comment. The last place that I worked, everybody at lunchtime would go to Sweet Green to the, you know, yeah. get a salad. Mm -hmm. And I once commented that if I went into the common eating area with a bag of McDonald's at at lunchtime, it would be like carrying in a bag of pornography. People would look at you and say, what yeah. on earth is he doing? He's eating that, but we are getting fatter, right? So there, I mean, it seems like the sort of middle class, upper middle class is kind of cleaving off mm -hmm. and becoming healthier, but that's not the case across the board. Well, I don't like that the class sure. as, the, as the, I think it's a consciousness thing. Yeah. As you become a more aware of what certain foods do to your body and your health and your longevity, you start to make different choices. Does that choices. overlap with class though, in some ways? It may overlap with class, yeah. but it's driven by consciousness. I mean, in education levels than it is class. But I mean, so sometimes um, uh, 
class can correlate with that. Is yeah. it causation or c- correlation? We don't really know. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Because I remember the conversations that came out of nowhere um, about this issue. And I thought of you during this time, because I just said, you know, if there's somebody who knows about this stuff, it'd be John Mackey. Was this the idea of the food desert? Mm-hmm. There are places where people can't get good food. When, when your stores are expanding, <clears throat> you know, you've had, I don't know how many more than in the past 10 years. But uh, do, those, do those exist? Food deserts? Is that a real thing? Do food deserts exist? Yes. Now, the question is, why do they exist? Mm. And if you're anti-capitalist, if you're anti-markets, then you believe they exist because there's a plot by the capitalists to keep food from from poor people, lower education, lower income levels, and uh, and that they're victims of that, that there's just nobody that mm-hmm. that cares about them. When, of course, the answer is not, it's the opposite of that. It's people, entrepreneurs would fill that need if that's what that market wanted, mm-hmm. but it largely isn't what that market wants. I mean, somebody wants it, but not enough to make it a viable business. That's the real challenge. Um, the market will provide what people want, and, and it's no different. In, it's particularly clear with food. If people want to eat vegan food, then vegan restaurants pop up. But if they don't want to eat it, then vegan restaurants die. The market is responsive, and that includes in in areas that are food deserts. Or as I like to say when people say, how come Whole Foods doesn't do more in that area? First, I say, well, we did a lot of things in those areas. We, we opened several stores in what were called food deserts, and some of them did well yeah. if they could draw from a wider area than that immediate area, and others did not do so well. And it was simply because the market really didn't want what we were selling. And you have yeah. to, you have to, and, 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 I, and, and if people get mad about that, I would say, look, then why don't you be the entrepreneur? If you feel like the market is missing an opportunity here, that you could sell healthy food in these so-called food deserts, do it because think how much money you can make. Because someone's leaving money on the That's table. That's right. Somebody's right? leaving money on the table. Yeah. But don't blame me because people aren't choosing to buy the foods that we offer up. It's not our fault if some people don't choose to buy that. I just remembered actually that I wrote a story about this for the Wall Street Journal a long time ago when, when Whole Foods opened uh, in Jamaica Plain in Boston. That was a huge success. Huge that was, success. That, and that's a good example though of... Uh, we had some pushback from the immediate, the activists in the immediate neighborhood yeah. that we were, you know, gentrifying this neighborhood. Which, of course, that was gentrifying before we got there. Long but before, yeah. We may have accelerated it. Markets change and evolve over time. Yeah. I, we saw this with lots of Whole Foods. We put a, we put a Whole Foods in there. Real estate prices would go up, and people would want to move in close to the Whole Foods because it would solve their food issues. And neighborhoods would change and evolve. It's fascinating how dynamic. Markets are. If you, I, I, I'm old enough now, and I've lived long enough. I did this long enough to watch things change. Most people don't see the changes because they happen. You know, they might happen sl- yeah. steadily but slowly. The seen and the unseen. That's right. Um, end of the book. You say that capitalism is often described as, you know, uh, rapacious and greedy. Mm-hmm. How do you define it? If that's not the words that come to your mind when you hear the word capitalism? Well, first of all, the, the, that economic system's held to unfair standards in my mind. Mm. The first standard it's held up to is that anytime uh, business people are not acting altruistically, they're attacked and criticized, yeah. as if every other part of society acts altruistically. Yeah. And so they're called greedy and rapacious because they need to make money in order to exist, and because they are judged by the worst actors. Mm-hmm. There are greedy and selfish and rapacious business people, just like there are greedy, rapacious, and selfish doctors and lawyers and government officials, because human nature is human nature. It's not worse if you're in business, and it's not better if you're in a nonprofit or if you're in the government. Human nature is sort of ubiquitous. What did you learn about human nature from running this company for so long? I learned that human beings are complex, that Humans are both uh, self-interested for themselves and their families and their immediate and their tribe or whatever they however they define that, but they also can be caring and they can be compassionate. And so, if if you try to set up a a, a company that you recognize those things, you don't ask everybody to make sacrifices all the time. You, you realize people are going to be driven by self-interest. Set up your incentive systems correctly, but at the same time. 
uh, when you when you create relationships between people, that brings out the best in human nature. Right. It brings out the caring. It brings out the ability to be generous. People almost always reduce human nature to these sort of cardboard characters. Mm -hmm. You know, you're either the money bags guy in Monopoly or you're or you're a saint. Mm -hmm. And humans are complex. We're both, and and we're we're in different mixes of those things. The thing that people understand about business and capitalism is that it's going to give people what they want. Not necessarily what they need or what's best for them, mm -hmm. because people are making those choices themselves, and they may make bad choices. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll make they'll eat junk food, you know. I mean, because it, we evolved, we evolved <laughs> when calories were scarce. Yeah. For most of our tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of evolutionary history, we didn't get very many calories. We were trying not to starve to death. So now we can get them, not just three times a day. We can get it all day long. And so we keep making bad choices, but we're kind of being driven by our biology. It's not that business is evil. They're just trying to give people what they're buying. Mm -hmm. And what they want is calorie-dense foods, even though they're not very good for us, not now healthy for us. I mean, there's so much. I mean, I say this to my daughter the other day, trying to impart um, economic lessons on her when she said that a certain athlete was overpaid. And I said, my dear, they never overpay somebody. If they, they pay them as little as they can get away with, they're paying $330 million because LeBron James is selling jerseys in China, and that's part of his value. And she was like, oh, I guess that makes sense. Well, sometimes now. they do overpay, but that's just a bad business It's a bad decision, business, and it doesn't – I mean, NBA's not going to – They didn't do it yeah. deliberately. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of my one of my friends that uh, really was kind of one of the founders of the conscious capitalism movement, Michael Strong, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Michael by Yeah, James. libertarian, yeah. Yeah. Michael said, you know, John – if you would just be a progressive, you would be the toast of the media. They love Whole Foods and they cannot reconcile the fact that they love Whole Foods, but they don't like you because of your political views. I believe in free markets and free minds. I really believe in capitalism. To me, it's just about intellectual integrity. That the, the facts of, are so compellingly clear. If people could just read Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, or Johann Norberg's books in Defense of Global Capitalism, or the now the rework of that, the Capitalist Manifesto. If they would read um, Marion Tupi's book on uh, mm -hmm. superabundance, people just don't understand the past. If they understood how bad humanities had it, they would they would come around to my point of view. They compare capitalism to a utopia in their minds. Mm -hmm. they, they look around and they see there's still inequality. They see that people sell bad products to people that people want to buy. And, and they, they blame globalization and the changes that it makes. They, and they just, you know, I think that goes back to somebody like Karl Marx in a way. But even before Marx, he caught on. I mean, he was articulating something people wanted to believe. When societies are changing and evolving, um, power statuses change. Uh, and people look for they look for something to blame, mm. and so for me, capitalism has been this great benefactor to the human race by all every objective measurement. But it's not perfect; it hasn't delivered utopia. And so people don't compare today to the past; they compare today to what it could be in their minds. Mm. And capitalism is blamed for not having utopia that they want right now. And so, yeah, I defend capitalism and I make the arguments. I put the data out there. I put the I put the facts out there. And every once in a while, a rational person changes their mind, but it's rare, very rare. Were there people in the sort of rise, during the rise of Whole Foods that said, John, can you pull that back a little bit? I mean, our clientele, they're hippy-dippy, progressives. Sure, my PR team the whole way along. Yeah. Way, the whole way along. Was, but I failed media training because people ask me a question, I generally try to answer it truthfully. It's a theme throughout the book, the various attempts at unionization or your battles with people within certain unions. And there's one you focus on in Madison, mm -hmm. which was a successful effort initially yes. to unionize your store. Why are you so skeptical of unions? I'm not... I'm not skeptical of unions. I mean, I think unions have played an incredibly valuable, have an incredible valuable place. I mean, it was unions that resisted communism, right? In Poland, uh, solidarity. Unions have and helped, in the U.S. actually. Yes, and unions have yeah. uh, unions have helped workers' rights to advance over 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 you know the last hundred plus years. So, unions have been 
the, the, rightly understood, they've been a very valuable thing. And in, in, in a free society, unions have to be allowed. And only in a non-free society would you not have unions. Yeah. So I'm trying to say I'm not skeptical of unions. But what I'm trying to say is that what most people don't understand about unions in the United States is there's only one kind of union that's allowed in the United States. It's legal. Those are adversarial unions. Company unions, like you have in Japan, are illegal. The, the, the union movement, the labor movement, has made a competitor of theirs, which would be a company union, illegal to do. And so the, the structure in American unions is inherently adversarial. And at Whole Foods, we're trying to create this stakeholder, deeper partnership with our team members. Um, and so I always viewed the unions as competitors. They were competing for the hearts and minds of our team members. And if we didn't treat our people well, I mean, they have to pay union dues. And, you're, and you, it, the, the companies, if they're fighting between management and labor, you're not going to have as good an organization. It's not going to be as good a place to work. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly in the marketplace because you don't have that cooperation between trust. I mean, it's a trust. Like capitalist function in there where the unions are competing with you and making you in a way. Yeah, that's right. You know, that's what I say. Workers better, made, yeah. they, they kept us honest. They made us become better employers. You can't take your workers for granted because they have an alternative in the marketplace. Not only can they go work someplace else, they can decide to stay and organize. And um, now I respect that right. So I'm, I'm not skeptic about unions. I'm not anti-union. The unions are always calling me anti-union. I'm not anti-union. I'm simply recognize that I want Whole Foods to be such a great place to work that people won't choose to have a union. They could. We can't stop them. But... They chose not to, except in Madison. Ultimately, they then they changed their mind. They decertified the union. They decertified it. It, it. Why? The union made all kinds of promises about what they were going to do. If you if you if you elect us a union, we're going to change the dress code. We're going to get you better health benefits. We're going to get you better pay. Uh, we're going <clears> to. <throat> it's just all kinds of. They can make any kind of promise they want. Corporations, the companies, cannot make any promises when a union unionization campaign is on. We can just say we're going to try to do better in the future. But you can't make any specific promises. So, for one, the union was unable to deliver on their promises. But more importantly, after that unionization thing, it was a wake-up call for me personally. And I made this tour. I went to every Whole Foods Market store in the company. I met with ev with every probably just about every team member, every store. I met with the leadership and the and the team members in the stores. And I asked them the same question: How can we make Whole Foods the best place to work for in America? And we changed things at Whole Foods, hmm. in every store in the company but one. We couldn't change them in Madison. So we started making all these improvements. We improved our health benefits. We improved um, uh, dress code. We improved um, compensation. But we had to negotiate with the union. We offered it to Madison. We'd like to do these things in this store too. No, you have to negotiate with us. And so all the other stores are getting all these better benefits, better health care, better, better compensation, except for this one store. And the team members at Madison saw that they weren't getting what the other Whole Foods Market stores were getting, and the union wasn't delivering on its promises. So I guess after a year, they decertified it. And guess what? Uh, they immediately got pay, pay increases and new, and new benefits because they got what everybody else had. The unions made Whole Foods a better company. They taught us a valuable lesson. And we just, you know, I never forgot it. After that, it was like, we're going to be the best place to work. And we were. We were voted one of the 100 best companies to work for for 20 consecutive years until up until the Amazon merger when we were really no longer eligible to do that because we're mm. part of Amazon now. So I'm pro-union and I see them as a competitor. I see all my competitors as making Whole Foods better. I'm not anti-Trader Joe's. <clears throat> Trader Joe's made Whole Foods a better company. I'm not anti Walmart or Costco or anybody else, those are competitors. Competitors are essential in capitalism. They innovate, they compete, and you have to up your game. That's how you make progress in a free society. Is there something in the, say, past 10 years that you thought was true 10 years ago that you no longer believe to be true? What's happened in that period of time when you've seen everything evolve and you've seen the world change where you said, you know, I think I was wrong about that? <clears throat> I'll tell you the biggest thing, and it, 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 you may have learned this a long time ago, but I only learned it in the last 10 years. Most people don't change their mind based on facts and evidence. I do most of the time, but 
I have found that arguments seldom convince people to change what they believe. Yes. And so it would have saved me a lot of grief if I'd known that when I was younger, because I, 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 I consider myself a very good debater. Yeah. And I, I win a lot of arguments, but people don't change their minds. What were you arguing about? Could 10, argue 15, about anything. Years ago. Argue about the economy, yeah. capitalism, diet, yeah. um, politics, religion. I mean, you know, just whatever the topic is. I, I, I kind of think like a. I think dialectically. I think like yeah. a debater. Yeah. And I, I can get all my arguments together. I, it's kind of a theme in the book because mm -hmm. my father was that way, and I learned to debate at the dinner table, and it, and it's a skill I have, but it. For most people, they do not persuade. Confirmation bias is rampant. I didn't realize how powerful it was 10 years. Yeah. It's taken me about the last 10 years to realize I shouldn't argue with people because it doesn't do any good. Yeah. Uh, or I should need I need to know my person I'm talking to. If I present evidence and facts, will they change their mind? Or will they do what most people do, which is do a search on the internet and find whatever it is, you can find it on the internet that reinforces what you believe. T take coffee, for example. If you do a, a Google search on coffee, and if you ask the question, is coffee good for you? You will find this massive amount of evidence that coffee is really good for you. Mm -hmm. Rephrase that question, is coffee bad for you? There's a massive amount of evidence that says yeah. coffee is bad for you. Yeah. And But people, because of confirmation bias, they will seek out the information that confirms what they want to believe. This is <laughs> this was actually came up the other day. I was, arguing with my girlfriend and she said, I'm going to look it up. And I was like, you can find anything on the internet that confirms what you just said, but what you said was stupid and wrong. But, uh, you know, I didn't you win that argument. You may not have a girlfriend very long, you know, Michael, I'm trying to learn from your book, John. But people who buy this book, people who buy this book are thinking, John Mackey, you know, started a little hippie grocery store in Austin, Texas, sold the thing for $14 billion almost to, to Amazon. I want to glean some lessons on how to, how to be an effective CEO, manager, whatever. Is that kind of argumentative streak? Is that a good thing for being a, an effective leader, an effective CEO? What's good is being a good decision maker. I mean, ultimately leaders are paid for making good decisions. And you can, you know, all leaders make some bad decisions from time to time, but you gotta, it's like playing in the major leagues. Yeah. You, you need to hit 300 if you're gonna be a, a, a good major league baseball player. Or if you're playing basketball, you need to be able to hit the three-point shot with yeah. some degree of accuracy. Whatever, whatever your game is, you have to be good at it. Well, leaders have to make a lot of decisions, decisions about people, decisions about strategy, decisions about when something's not going to work and when to cut bait and admit you made a mistake so you can turn around. You have to be able to persuade people of things. Mm -hmm. But if you're good at persuading people to do the wrong thing, then just having persuasive abilities is far less important than being somebody who can make right good decisions that work. I mean, there's a succession element in this book too. Yes. I mean, there's a chapter about a coup against you. There, there's a chapter in a coup, but in fact, there were at least four or five coups that I point out. This in is the like book. a Latin American country, not a grocery store. I used the metaphor, the Lord of the Rings, which had a big influence on me when I was, I read it like five times before yeah. I got out of high school. And I, I refer to it a few times in the book. And there's the ring of power, if you know the story. Yeah. And the ring of power is corrupting. The, the, most people cannot wear that ring of power. And Were you but, corrupted by it? You'd have to ask other people. Do you think of course, you were corrupted No, by I don't it? think I was. Yeah. I think other people were that wanted to wear the ring. It's kind of hard not to be, right? I don't know. Um, if, I find you really, people, if, if you're really mission driven yeah. and you're really committed to, like I was, I really had the higher sense of higher purpose, really cared about our stakeholders. I always, I tried to do the right thing. Yeah. Did I always do the right thing? No. Did I have the ego? Well, I had the ego sometimes. So mm -hmm. I'm not a perfect human being. So, I mean, certainly if you brought all the critics in here, they would tell you yeah. what an awful person I am. Yeah. What do the critics I, say? What's, what's the one that resonates most with you and, and, or, or kind of rankles with you and say, that's not fair. And I'm not that person at all. Well, I poke fun at myself early on because one of my co-founders called me Wacky Macky. Yes. And and uh, but I I sort of I take a delight in it now because yeah. was I wacky because so many things turned out really well. Yeah. And it, all the predictions were kind of turned out wrong. So, but what is really a criticism that rankles is one that you if it's if you know it's not true it doesn't bother you so it hurts when you realize that it is true, but you don't want to admit it's true. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if 
I'm I'm willing. I that whole book is about a lot of mistakes that I made. Mm -hmm. So I make a lot of mistakes. You're changing your mind, uh, Karen. Yes, right. and I made mistakes. I made bad business decisions. I, mm -hmm. I have a chapter called the hundred million dollar mistake. This is the internet stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also mm -hmm. buying that that mail order vitamin company was a huge mistake. Yeah. And and I've made terrible mistakes about about uh, leaders and people and whatnot. So I made a lot of mistakes. Those criticisms don't rankle me because. If, if you're defenseless, if you just go ahead and admit that you made the mistakes, then you don't have to defend anything any longer. You know, I mean, you talk about when, when you asked your dad to resign from the board, you said that the problem right now is I can't take somebody who's risk averse. I, I need somebody who's uh, a little more risk tolerant now. And I mean, that's the same thing when you're talking about your, your personal beliefs. I mean, see, that like someone like you that's going to take risks in business is also going to take risks in telling people what they believe, right? Right. Probably yeah. so. I, you know, my dad's case, that was different. It wasn't, to, I didn't understand, you know, m my father, he had Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. but we just, it didn't get diagnosed until about a year or so after he left the board. Mm -hmm. But when you read about the early symptoms of Alzheimer's, it's these emotional outbursts he was having. He's irrational. My father never been irrational. He yeah. always, if you made a good argument, he changed his mind. Here he was just blowing up all the time. And that's one of the symptoms of the, or when you get Alzheimer's, those are one of the f yeah. first things that be you begin to notice. So I didn't get him off the board because uh, we were arguing about, because we were arguing this because he was no longer irrational. He was angry all the time for no good reason. And he couldn't even defend his point of view. And I just, you know, it was just, we're a public company. It was just, it was just, it could, it was intolerable. And I, I like the bit where after he's diagnosed and you get in an argument with him and he says, well, you won, but I would have wiped the floor with you yeah, if I didn't so have Alzheimer's. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. I mean, my dad was such a good arguer and yeah. debater. And, and uh, uh, so many times I felt like I had the facts and he was just so good at it. You know, mm -hmm. a good, he was so good at, you know, making rhetorical uh, points of points of view that he could twist things. And he'd sometimes get the better of the argument, although I really felt like I had the facts. But at that stage, he no longer he he couldn't wipe the floor with me anymore. Do Do you feel that a story like that? I mean, you tell that, and it's you know, in some ways, it's like well, it's a good, refreshing bit of honesty here of what you're dealing with in this situation and how difficult it was for you. I mean, your dad says something in response to you that is almost crushing to mm -hmm. hear. He's it's something to the effect of, "This is what I have left now, yeah. and you're taking it away from me," and that was takes the wind out of you when you're reading it. Do you worry that people think that oh, he's a bit cutthroat to do things like that? There's a few moments in the book where you have the guy from Bread and Circuses who kind of betrays you in a way and you say, well, afterwards, he got a divorce, his wife took half of it, and he got taxed up the wazoo, so I'm <laughs> sorry that you lost. <laughs> the, but the, is, that, is that the kind of business nature of you I don't, that people think contradicts with your kind of hippie-ish background? As I stated previously, human beings are complex. Yeah. We are both self-interested. And we're caring, loving beings. We're both. And so I'm just honest about who I am. I just show up, try to be an authentic person. You know, I've, in life, Michael, um, holding on to anger and judgments about people is really poisons your soul. It's a very yes. bad thing to do. So, I mean, the guy that did the coup, Chris Hitt, he and I are friends. I mean, I, I put him in the Whole Foods Hall of Fame. I've once said if if you hold, I mean he really comes across as if an you asshole hold, in that book, particularly in the coup when he comes up and well, says it's your time, your time's going to go. You, you, and he said you don't have the votes. He said, well, you know, too bad. It's your time to go. Yeah, and then he loses that battle. You can be friends with him after that because Chris really did feel like he was. He really did believe that he was better equipped. All those guys that did the coup thought they should be running the company. Yeah, they just thought they were better than me. None of those guys wanted to admit I was maybe a better leader than they were yeah. because they thought they were really good leaders. It's the way the ego works. It doesn't really want to admit those type of things. Let me ask you the boring, tedious, cliched question that I'm sure you get all the time, but people are actually interested, and that's probably why people will buy this book, is you know, being an entrepreneur, I don't think I have the, the kind of intel, the, the architecture for it, the internal architecture. I remember I once asked Christopher Hitchens why he he wrote about novels all the time. I said, "Do you ever write a novel yourself?" He said, "I just don't have one in me. It doesn't exist. I looked and it's not there. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I could do what you do, and I don't know if I could learn it. You know, people go to business school, et cetera, and there's classes on entrepreneurship. Well, I never did any of that. You never did any of that. I, I had, never went I to did. journalism school, as you can right. tell right now. <laughs> 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 Waste of money. I mean, you didn't. You don't have a degree, right? Right. No." 
Peter Thiel and people in the libertarian universe say, don't go to college. Go out and, you know, make your money and shoot your best shot and, and, and try to live your dream. I mean, is that something you agree with? By the way, Michael, has anybody ever told you you look a little bit like Peter Thiel? I, I wish I was a lot like Peter Thiel in some ways because <laughs> I am broke and he is not. I mean, can you teach this? Is this something that is just who you are? Or is this something that you learned along the way? Can other people it's, learn this? It's both. I mean, there is a set of skills you have to learn. I, I wasn't, I had the entrepreneurial instincts when I was younger. I just didn't have any skill. I had to, I had to make a lot of mistakes. I had to learn. <clears throat> people ask me, <clears throat> what's different with my new business than the first business? Well, I'm older. I have less energy. That's the negative. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I've got, I've got this whole lifetime of lessons that I've learned mm -hmm. about, about leadership about how to how to create a company and build it and grow, grow it and nurture it. So I'm bringing a lot more intellectual capital than I had. I just have a lot less, you know, I don't have the passion of a 25-year-old. Can I be very cynical and you won't get mad at me? Is it also then, excuse my language, I mean, it's also that you kind of have fuck you money now too, right? I mean, you can do I may not. If very I, I'm pouring risky. a lot of it in love really? life. So. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're just, but yeah, yeah, you're putting a lot of money into this and, you know, you, it's a little more comfortable to do that now. I mean, when you're doing Whole Foods, your life was on the line in a lot of ways when you were doing that. When right? you're young, you have if you fail, you have a lot. You have time to recover. Yeah. So if I was to go bankrupt at my age today, it'd be hard to recover that. Yeah. So I'm not. So you're right with the fuck you money mm -hmm. in the sense that I'm going to put a lot of money into love life, but I'm not going to risk everything. I'm not going to risk my wife's, you know, yeah. old age and comfort. What is it like living with fuck you money? Um, the the. <laughs> The real importance, the, the most valuable thing about people under, misunderstand what wealth really is yeah. um, because some people get addicted to money. I've never felt addicted to money. For me, money has always represented freedom, independence. I can do whatever I want to do. And that's why wealth, that's the value of wealth. I can also be generous and I am generous. I can be generous with my friends. I can be generous with people I don't know. Generosity is a good virtue. And I can practice that abundantly and be and giving and giving, um, but mostly for me, it's been I am free, uh, and I can do ever what I whatever I want to do. That's a good feeling to have. Yeah, I don't think it was fuck you money because that's like screw you. I you know yeah. I don't. That's not the way I think about. It. I just feel like whatever I want to do, I can do. Yeah, there's not that many things I want to do, but if I want to do them, I can do them. Yeah, I mean the fuck you money is probably the it's probably you're right. It's probably the wrong phrase because I mean someone who has fuck you money is like something like Louis C.K. who is like, you can try to cancel me, but I can fill up Madison Square Garden tomorrow for three nights in a row. Or J JK Rowling with exactly. you know, the, the trans thing. Exactly. She can speak her mind because it, it you can't ruin her. Right. It's impossible Harry to ruin Potter's, her. Harry Potter books are going to keep selling. Keep selling. I mean I asked that question because not everyone and probably a very, very small percentage of people have thought about opening a grocery store or opening a store. Every single person has thought what they would do if they had a limitless supply of money. I mean, did, you, did, did it change in a way when, like, what you thought you would do? I mean, I know you from a universe in which you're very active in Cato Institute and things like this. I mean, you have the ability to kind of come in and, and help causes that you're interested in. Um, it's a you know. A, did, did you ever hear the? Um, you don't buy planes. I'm going to bridge to it. Yeah. We'll come back to this, but I'm going to bridge to something. Have yeah, you ever sure. heard the? You know, I don't think I think it's a true. There was a the uh, the dialogue that Joseph Heller and um, Kurt Vonnegut had about money. You've heard that one. Yeah. You have Kurt Vonnegut and and uh, Joseph Heller. Joseph Heller wrote Catch Twenty Two, and they're at this bit billionaires party, and the, 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 and Kurt Vonnegut goes up to to Heller and he says, so this guy, he makes more money every day than you'll make for all the books you, all, Catch 22 and all the other books you've ever written and, and sold. What do you think about that? And he says, well, I've got one thing he'll never have. And he says, what's that? He says, I have enough. Yeah. So money, power, fame, success, these are very addicting things. Human beings are easily addicted to those things. Mm -hmm. Unless you can master yourself and understand that those things will not satisfy your soul, it, it buys independence. It doesn't give you happiness. 
It doesn't create fr real friends for you. It doesn't give in you- In fact, it creates a lot of fake friends, right? It does. Yeah. It doesn't give you the things that are the most important things in life, which are love, friendship, purpose. And if you chase after money for its own sake, even if you get it, you're not going to find your soul is satisfied. So, and people will say, well, that's easy for him to say he's got enough money. But the, the key word is I have enough. You know, I stopped taking compensation from Whole Foods back in 2006. I gave all my stock options away. I had enough. I didn't need more. I'm not doing my new business to get more money. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it out of a sense of purpose and mission. And because I'm an entrepreneur, it's going to be fun. It is fun. Creating something is fun. Yeah. And I think back to that other thing we're talking about, entrepreneurship. You said you don't think you had that within I you. I don't think I have it in you, no. Well, I can tell you, everyone has creativity within them. Yeah. So I don't know what your creative outlets are, but we are fundamentally, for human beings, we have this creative part to our being. Yeah. Most people, it gets damped down on because, you know, because of school or whatever. We get criticized a lot. We become fearful to be creative. Um, but an entrepreneur is someone that has creativity in the form of creating businesses, enterprises. Yeah. Um, and as so I try to capture in the book, because I think the entrepreneurs that have read my book really like it, uh, because they feel like, that's me. He's describing, he's describing me. <clears throat> entrepreneurs, for them, they, they, I always get asked questions about risk. What do, you, what do you think about this risk? What do you think about this risk? It's like, entrepreneurs don't think about risk. I mean, they might think about whether this is a high percentage bet or not, yeah. but they're not actually kind of like weighing risk out so much. They're, so as, as they're asking the question, is for them, it's more like play. Yeah. I think that's going to be fun. I, I think we'll figure that out as we go along. I, ne I never worried too much about failure. It was more about, um, I always had confidence in any situation, we could figure it out. We could find the solution. And if we couldn't think of it, we could create it. There are always solutions to problems, and sometimes you don't know the solution until you've dived in, mm -hmm. and you then you and then it comes to you, and so it's that playfulness, which is one of the key themes of the book: play, creativity, and love. Those are the things that has made my life in a rich, meaningful, good life. Those those things. What a perfect way of ending it, John Mackey. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Michael. I've enjoyed our conversation.